Cool. I get this time to, to chill here with Mike Foch from Cary Chapel, of Philadelphia. Mike, What's up? you doing well? Doing very well. Glad to be here. You know, um, I was talking to Wade the other day, and I know we kind of talked about it a little bit ago. Calvary Distinctives, uh, you've kind of um, done like a podcast or kind of broken down, which is awesome because us coming from here with Pastor Rawl, we have such a heart for that. Like when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to growth, when it comes to um, giving vision for the next generation, mm -hmm. uh, we go to the Calvary Distinctives. We go to the second of um, Romaine and stuff like that. Yeah. Why was it important for you to kind of dive into the Calvary Distinctives? Yeah, so me and we put out a podcast called Calvary Distinctives 2.0, and me and another guy at our church, another assistant pastor named Brian Weed, mm -hmm. both middle-aged dudes, both kind of grew up in Calvary. Both of us also didn't have immediate connection with Chuck Smith. Mm -hmm. And uh, for two reasons. One is with COVID, we had so many new people at our church mm -hmm. and we don't have membership classes in Calvary, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So we thought, let's, let's revisit this as kind of second generation people. And our goal is to show that we're not Calvary because we're Calvary. We grew up in this building or this method. We're Calvary because it's biblical mm -hmm. and those things haven't changed. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to both state that for people who have been Calvary, kind of second generation, and then also do it for new folk at our church. So we were going to do it just live for our church because we thought it would be something beneficial. But my dad was like, why don't you guys record it because then we can send it out to anybody or they can get it. They don't have to be in the building for kind of the live thing. You know, it's so important, that, you know, understanding your foundation. I like what you just said, too, because it's like asking the questions why. Because it's very easy to go through the, the motions of stuff and just, well, this is just what we do, but not knowing the purpose and why and the, the functionality of something. I, I heard this saying years ago, and it kind of stuck with me, and it was, before you remove a fence, talking about the boundaries and the borders that yeah. it's talked about in the Bibles, before you remove a fence, first ask yourself the question, why was that fence there mm -hmm. in the beginning? You know, because a lot of them have purpose. You know, when you look at some of the foundational principles and diving into it yourself, just from a personal aspect, what kind of stood out to you as you dove in? Now, did you guys kind of like break down the chapters? Of yeah. The yep. So we did it by chapter, basically. And we kind of um, basically encouraged people to read the chapter and then listen to the discussion. And what we would do is we would say, here's Chuck's biblical point. And then here are the stories he kind of tells to apply it. Mm. Um, because, you know, Chuck didn't come, obviously, from a Calvary Chapel mm. background. And a lot of the things he learned, he shares those stories in the book as applications of the point he's making. Mm. So the, the biblical points are things that don't change. And we wanted to kind of show, even as second-generation people, which I think people growing up in Calvary, you, you have to come to a place, if you're serious about the Bible, where you say, do I actually believe these things? Mm. And why are these things the way we do things? Mm. Um, and we just wanted to show these are still biblical. And here's what Chuck was essentially saying to kind of apply it. So, you know, sometimes there's things in the book that you can get confused. Chuck would say he doesn't allow people to stand during worship, right, you know. Right. But the whole point of the chapter is to make a focus of Christ in worship, mm -hmm. not whether people stand or not. So, right. you know, we point out, no, Christ-centered worship is the biblical principle we hold to. This was Chuck's way of applying that yeah. at Calvary Costa Mesa. And the thing that remains is the principle, not necessarily how he practiced or applied it all. Yeah, no, and I, and I think it's important to know like that, that identification, right? You know, there's many other ministries that are out there, and there is a distinction of Calvary Chapel. Sure. You know, we would always say, Pastor always say, Calvary Chapel is not the only way, but it's the way that we've been called to do ministry. It, it's the model that's been passed down to us, and it's effective, and it's biblical, mm -hmm. as you said, said as well. You know, and you're looking at Chuck, if you go through his book, um, many of his books, Why Grace Changes Everything, the one where he sat down with his son, Memoirs of Grace, where he kind of breaks down, like, his life, and it talks about those challenges of mm -hmm. growing up in the Foursquare, and, you know, just seeing some things after a while, and be like, how come I don't feel comfortable with this mode of ministry any longer? Yeah. And it's just this this growth, there's a development. And it going back to like the biblical aspect kind of like shows you, you know, I think one of the great chapters, obviously, and it's a bedrock of Calvary Chapel is the priority of the word. Yeah. Right. Putting a heavy emphasis on 
the teaching of the Word of God. It revolutionized Chuck's life personally. He saw it impact the church. And for us, and I'm, I'm sure with your dad and the ministry that you're from as well, with Pastor All here, teaching the Word of God, you know, Genesis to Revelation, it's so valuable. Yeah. Well, why is that such an important earmark? Because it's very easy to go in other flows of teachings. And why does that such an important aspect of Calvary Chapel Distinctive. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's unique, at least to me when I look at it, there's been other individuals through history who have realized the necessity to make an emphasis of the word. Like Matthew Henry is pretty mm-hmm. famous for that. William Still is pretty famous with that. There's a guy named Harold St. John that was an itinerant preacher that would teach through books of the Bible so that people would get it. Guys, even today, a John Piper or Mark Dever, they'll There'll be guys who make an emphasis of teaching through the word. Yeah. But as far as I know, Calvary Chapel is the only movement that holds to expositional teaching as a distinction. And I think that, that the fruit of that has, number one, been obvious in the growth of our churches, in the quality of the Christian life that people are seeing and being produced, and three, even in the amount of uh, you know, there's large, there's church movements with the same amount or even less churches that have way more bureaucracy and way more problems. Mm. And I think Calvary's been saved from a lot of those issues right. because of our emphasis of teaching through the Word mm. and how that kind of trickles down to people and where the authority is. There's so many different levels that that really plays out in. Yeah. And then for you, as far as you, Mike, just kind of like growing in your own relationship with the Lord, you love teaching the Word of God as well. You know, I, I've been asking some of the guys this question. Is there a, a book of the Bible that you just love a lot, like one that you just connect with, that it's like your, I don't want to say your go-to, but yeah. just one that you, I don't know, I have mine. I'll yeah, I, some, sometimes that's hard because sometimes you favor the one you're in at yeah. the moment, you mm-hmm. know, but... I do find myself going back to a lot of John's writings. Mm. You know, I feel like I vibe with that stuff a lot. So the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Mm. some of the things that John writes um, about just abiding with the Lord, uh, heaven, you know, Mm. some of those things, the work of the Holy Spirit are things that have been things that have stuck with me my whole life and are kind of foundational things that I fall back on. No, and I, it's, it's deep, right? And you look at the, the Gospel of John, we're always told and encouraged per, person, if you've never gone through the Bible before, you know, start in the Gospel yes. of John. Yep. You know, there's an aspect where it's simple, but at the same time, it's profound. It's so deep, right? you got, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, the Nicodemus. There's different stories in there that are highlighted and focused on. Uh, it has such an important richness to it. And then also... You saw like all John's writings, like First John. First John is phenomenal, and like the history of of Calvary Chapel as well as uh, it's been noted when Pastor Chuck, as he would go and you know do his two years of teaching all of his topical sermons yeah. and then run out, <laughs> and then it was him finding the the Griffin Thomas outlines through First John that kind of revolutionized the teaching aspect. Mm-hmm. Wow, you can just cut this apart, slice it, and dice it. And it's so rich, and it covers so much, and it really brings you, if, if that f- gospel of John is focused toward, I, and I don't want to say just focused upon simplicity, it's not, it's so, so profound, but if we tell new believers to go through the gospel of John, first John has that level of maturity, yeah. that growth, going to the next level of your walk with God, so love it. How about... In the same kind of ballpark, how about a character of the Bible that you connect with? Because, you know, we're going through in the encounters of God, you know, through this conference here, the International Pastors Conference, and all the teachers are going to be breaking down characters of the Bible. I find, like, a lot of blessings. Like, I love the life of Abraham. I've yeah. always been, i just blown away by his life when I look at a man known as a man of faith, but mm-hmm. then the Bible shows his uh, lapses of faith his mistakes, yeah. but his growth and his maturity. Um, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to say this, and it's not just because uh, this is what my dad's teaching on. Spoiler, if you listen <laughs> in early, I don't know when this is getting thrown out. Um, and maybe it's more the theme. Uh, Enoch has always been somebody, just mm. because of the, the simplicity in Genesis and then obviously in Hebrews where it's brought up, of, a, of just a person who walks with the Lord, mm. you know, um, and that pleases him. And to me... Like, if, if I can end my life being a normal guy that walked with Jesus then mm. and please Jesus, I, that's what I, I did when I was mm. supposed to do, mm. you know? So 
Um, so, you know, the, the scriptures say that about other folks, too. Obviously, Noah walked with God mm-hmm. it's in scripture. There's a couple places, but just that kind of theme of somebody who walked with God, yeah. except for him for 300-something years. No, I, you love know, I love it. Remarkable. You know, Pastor Raul love, loves the, the life of Enoch as well, and, and I've heard him teach Enoch so many times over the years. Impact, again, simplicity, but there's something so profound there as well, and and that's why I think that the Bible, understanding the Bible, understanding the characters of the Bible, understanding Genesis to Revelation, there's so much value in your life, yeah. you know, because you're just talking about, you, you know, growing up around the church and, you know, finding and developing your own relationship with God. And then you also understand sometimes, you know, there's that song of worship that I'm coming back to the, the heart of worship and it, it's all about you and it's all about you because sometimes... We can get caught up in ministry. We can get caught up in a lot of things. We can make the Christian life more difficult than it has to be. And sometimes it's the simple of it's relationship with God. Yeah, It's having a love relationship with God. And just as um, God did a work in Abraham and David's life and, you know, all the, I, Isaiah, it's just like God met them in these various areas of their life. And they're not these supernatural superhero characters. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, they are broken men. I think of Gideon. He was a broken man. Like, you know, when the Lord appears to him and says, oh, you mighty man of valor. And he's like, mighty man of valor? You know, here he is hiding from the Midianites. And yet, the Lord knew the work that he would do in his life. And he would take this man who, from his own mindset, I'm the weakest of the tribe. My family's of the weakest tribe. I'm nothing. Like, how can you use me? And these moments were... God moves in a man's life is so profound, and it's how God can move in people's lives as well. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm excited. I thought it was an awesome theme for our conference, like encounters with God, uh, to, you know, the whole Bible takes for granted that God can speak with man and interact with man mm. and just states it so simply and doesn't have to explain every, you know, God said this to Abraham, doesn't explain how it happened or right. what it looked like. Just So I think it's great. Obviously, I've been praying that's what we that's what we actually get. We don't yeah. just talk about it, you know. Yeah, no, for and the sure. Lord does that for folks. And you know, there's such a you, the variety that we find. I'll circle back. One of the things I'm blessed with, in terms of giving the whole scripture and teaching the whole scripture, is I feel like I've been enriched with a whole God. You know, mm. you. It's hard for me to imagine my life not having been given the whole Bible mm. based off of what I have now. You know, mm. and being middle aged, we're probably pretty close you know I'm 46 okay I'm 42 okay yeah so you know you already you start to hit different stages in life and different people in different places in the scripture minister to you in different ways and those things so you know it's I'm just blessed to have been put in a place where given a whole bible like I'm given a whole god you Mm -hmm. know I get to see him in a holistic way uh where you know there's a lot of places that they don't have that privilege Mm -hmm. Uh, some people turn away from it or they don't like it. That's something else. But there's just so many people that you realize they've never even been, they've never even been given the whole scripture. Mike, there's obviously so many challenges going on in our world today. There, there's so much divide. There's so much confusion. Oh, man, I mean, all, all that's going on in Israel right now across the world, I mean, heavy. You know, and then I don't know, how how is your community doing in Philadelphia, doing ministry there so long, the heartbeat, the struggles, and maybe the good? When you look at the culture around you right now, um, what do you see as opportunity to do ministry during this time? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a tough one. Um, Obviously, there's, like in, in Philadelphia, probably as in many big cities in America, there's always a ton of great things going on, and there's always a lot of really difficult, hard things going mm-hmm. on. So I do think we're seeing people more open as the world gets crazier. Mm-hmm. And I also think people are seeing and realizing more the need for a community that actually loves people. You know, people's lives, mm-hmm. It's you can fulfill your flesh out there in the world, but, like, people don't really care about each other. Mm. They use one another. It's pretty cold out there. Um, So I was actually, I actually heard another lady even just coming into this conference saying they were flying in, and they had some other folks from the conference coming, and they were talking and laughing, and a lady sitting next to her was just like, 
man, you guys are really happy Christians. Like, how can I hang out with people mm. like you? Yeah. <laughs> and I just think it's cold out there, you know, mm-hmm. and people are looking for a place of real fellowship and yeah. love. And the church is the only place that can offer those things. No, I, I, I agree. I think uh, people want genuine and the word of God is timeless. It's never needed to be changed. Yep. Still has the power to change and transform lives. Uh, us for that they've been called to the Calvary Chapel movement. Uh, we have an, an heritage, a heritage that is rich. Um, we have an opportunity in these days that we're living in today. I've always said this before. It's like, imagine, like God knows everything. You know, He knows the day when we take our first breath, when we take our last breath. He knows the boundaries of our dwellings, right? The Word of God says. He knows the times that we're going to be living. And to recognize that the Lord has allowed us to live during this time in yeah. church history and world yeah. history, uh, we can't miss it. We can't miss that because it's very easy to get overwhelmed. You get stressed out about the news. You can get stressed out about even maybe stuff that's going on in people's families, but recognizing the call of God upon our lives. Um, what would you say right now, just in closing, Mike, of somebody that's kind of like, Sitting in the pews, not really knowing how to be used by God. Why, why is it important to discover the call of God in their lives? Yeah. Well, obviously, there's two reasons. The first is because you're going to see Jesus one day. Mm-hmm. And the most important thing is that you've pleased him. And when you stand before the beam of seat of Christ, that your life gets actually measured there. So, you know, our our aim is to just... It's not to change the world. It's just to do the things that he wants us to do, and he changes the world. So I think the key, at least for me, is, all right, Lord, here here I am. The world can be crazy, but like you said, you have us here. Uh, You had Noah building a boat when the world was about to end. Like, I'm just supposed to do the thing you want me to do, and you take care of the rest. You know, I feel like there's a lot of pressure to sometimes do what everybody else is doing or to feel like I need to live up to that. But the reality is he, he puts us where he wants us. We're just supposed to be salt and light right there. And that's also where a Christian finds the most joy mm-hmm. in walking with the Lord where he has them. That's, you know, you said salt and light, which is great, right? Um, Jesus spoke about it on the Sermon on the Mount, that to be the light of the world, to to be an example of Christ in our communities in this crazy world around us. Do not be overcome by the world. You know, the Bible, say, the Bible says, Jesus says that I have overcome the world. Mm-hmm. And though in this world we're going to have tribulation, we're going to go through tragedy, but I'm on your side. The Lord is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Mike, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me.